Hello. I'm, I'm excited to be here today. This is very exciting that we're talking about health and climate is very much related to health and use of fossil fuels. I'm, uh, I'm currently also uh, the vis Vice President of uh, Business Development at OpConnect, an electric vehicle fueling uh, company. And I, what I want to talk about here today is that we have invented all of the technology we need. Ooh, this is getting away from me here. We've invented all of the technology that we need to move to, move to a cleaner, all renewable electric infrastructure. Our modern day Edisons have done their job and we can, with what we have today, actually do it. Now, what we usually talk about or what is often talked about uh, is climate change. And when we think about renewable energy, we think about the fact that we need to uh, implement renewable energy and put solar panels on our roof because of climate change, because of this horrible thing happening, which it is terrible and, and it's something that uh, is very concerning. But the truth is we should actually move to this 21st century technology, clean technology, even if there were no climate change. And actually we would be moving in that direction, if it, or we will be, even without climate change. And that is the exciting news that I want to share with you today, is that this technology is actually better, it's cleaner, it's safer, and it's a technology that we should, we should move to even without climate change. So if we're going to move to an all electric renewable energy infrastructure, we have to think about not just our electricity, but we have to also think about our heating and cooling, as well as our transportation and our industry. Because we often think, and, and politicians in the news also talk about how, okay, we're moving to clean uh, renewable energy, and we're going to put up solar plants and wind plants, but there's actually more to it. It's the entire energy infrastructure. So if we're looking at our electricity, we are looking at solar, wind, or hydro, maybe energy storage technologies. Uh, we are also, you can also do hydrogen as well. But if we look at our transportation, we can look at hydrogen, as well as uh, hydrogen ships, hydrogen airplanes, electric vehicles. And there's also high heating and cooling. And that we would think about um, moving away from fossil fuel-based heating and move towards heat pumps. And that's heating of also the air and the water as well. So we'd move to solar hot water heaters and using heat pumps. And in industry also, we use many fossil fuels for uh, industrial processes and heating. The, the digital transformation has allowed this renewable uh, future, has, has helped facilitate this renewable future. We, the renewable future will have many different uh, distributed resources. We'll have solar and wind plants and solar panels on a roof and energy storage, big, huge uh, energy storage, but also storage in our, around our houses and neighborhoods. And the ability to manage that is facilitated by our digital technology. We also have the Internet of Things, which is our, our car can be something that's smart and and we can actually, as uh, individual people or the utility, have access to our cars so that at night we can, for instance, charge our cars at night when the wind is blowing and energy is super cheap and nobody is using it, uh, electricity at that time. And so when you have the Internet of Things, you, control, you can control these. You can also use our hot water heating, heaters, the water in our hot water uh, tanks, to put energy as well. You can heat our tanks at night. And, and that is where the Internet of Things is also useful in this energy transformation. Our personal devices as well, uh, where we can manage our own home energy use. And, and that is something uh, that has given this future, facilitated this future. We do have resources. One of the things that people have said to debunk uh, a renewable energy future is that we don't have the resources uh, to 
to do this. There isn't, we just couldn't do it with the technology we have in the research. But we actually have, researchers have found, we have 150 terawatts of solar PV alone. That's just solar PV in rural, not on our rooftops, nothing. That's 18 times the energy and the, electric, the capacity that we need to power all of our energy needs by the year 2050. And we have two and a half times the wind uh, capacity on, on um, offshore and onshore to power all of our needs. That's just with that. There's other technologies as well, geothermal or hydro and uh, wave that we can also access. So we, and that is, that is actually capacity that is on developable land, not sensitive land that will harm um, uh, sensitive and pristine landscapes or sensitive uh, um, animals. This is an ecosystem. This is actually, uh, folks who've done research have looked at this for on developable land, how much actual land that's been overgrazed already or that is, that, that is not sensitive. Now, if you want to think about, um, think of that, you'd see, you'd see that we would need about 0.2% of the U.S. land um, that's um, without spacing. Only 0.2% of U.S. land to do this. And, that's, and if you do consider spacing, like the spacing between the wind turbines, that's about 1.4% of U.S. land. It's not that much land that we would need for all of our energy needs once we build all of our solar plants, all of our wind farms. If you've gone out into the country and you have seen solar plants and wind farms, it seems like a lot, like it's taking a lot of land. But if you actually do all the calculations, look at what we would need, um, we actually don't need that much. And if you think about for our energy need compared to what we're using for our food needs, you need about 0.3 acres of energy per person, of uh, land per person. And that's compared to you need about one acre per person to feed, to, to feed us. The, the researchers have looked at how we would do this and, and we would have a mix. We'd have a mix of um, solar, wind, rooftop solar, offshore wind, wave technology. You'd also have, also have various uh, energy storage technologies. Mark Jacobson from Stanford University has done this research. The Solutions Project, you can look at it online. I'm not affiliated with them. They just have a lot of really good information. They will actually, they look at different states and they have done this analysis for what each state could do in the, in the US, as well as cities and towns. And they've done some international work as well. They've also found that it'll be 45% more efficient because running our future energy infrastructure on electricity is much more efficient than running it on fossil fuels. Fossil fuels, we need combustion, and combustion is less efficient than actually supplying the electricity to a car or for heating or, um, or what have you. Now, we need to do this quickly. I, I'm going to talk about how this is inevitable because it's a better disruptive technology. These are better and disruptive technologies, but uh, we do need to do it quickly. And the reason we need to do it quickly is we have a greenhouse gas budget. That means that's the amount of greenhouse gases we can put in the air before we go over 1.5 degrees Celsius. Originally, we were talking about staying below 2 degrees Celsius. The new International Panel of Climate Control has come out and said that we need to actually stay at about 1.5 degrees Celsius. We have um, the the... The amount of greenhouse gases we currently have in the air is about 2,230 uh, gigatons of carbon dioxide. We have about 420 to 580 gigatons of carbon dioxide left to put in the air. We can't put that much more. And every day we're adding to that. We're adding to that. We're, 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 you know, we're getting closer and closer to blowing this greenhouse gas budget. So we need, at this point, to start taking our fossil fuels offline about in the next 15 to 30 years. Ideally, in the next 15 years, we'd get to zero to, to be sure to stay, more sure to stay below 1.5 degrees Celsius. If we do it by the year 2050, then it's about a 50% chance of staying below um, 1.5 degrees Celsius. We will need to also do maybe forestation in some... Um, some actual um, negative emissions, which is actually taking carbon, di carbon dioxide of the air 
planting trees and doing some agricultural process can help that. And then there's other technology that's being developed, but it's not guaranteed. This is not uh, the, relying on future technology to take carbon dioxide out of the air is not the thing we need to do. It's a lot cheaper, a lot better to just start by four to 6% per year taking fossil fuels offline and removing emissions as well. So we do have the means to do this. It's going to be about 210,000 megawatts per year to get to, to, to um, that we need to, um, of renewable energy that we need to bring online. And researchers have done the um, calculations and, they, and it's looked that it'll be about three to 4% of our gross domestic product. It may seem like a lot, but our 4% is the gross domestic product uh, we usually, we, 4% uh, of our gross domestic product is currently what we spend on our military. So it's a, it's a lot of money, but it's not an outrageous. People have said, oh, this is a World War II effort. This is something that's going to be huge. We, we can't, we, you know, how are we going to do this? But really, it's an investment of 4% of our GDP. It's not a World War II effort. A World War II effort, we used 40% of our gross domestic product. And we transformed our industrial infrastructure in five years to, to, um, you know, to, to beat fascism, right? We didn't, we didn't do 4%. 4% is doable, and the money that we're currently using for other for our fossil fuel infrastructure can be taken offline and then allocated to our new 21st century clean uh, technology infrastructure. China, uh, if we also want to look at some of our um, um, folks around the world, China is planning to implement about 1 million megawatts of uh, greenhouse gas free energy by the year 2030. That's the total US electricity capacity. Okay? And that's about 3% of China's gross domestic, domestic product. So if they can do it, of course we can do it. I mean, this is not, this is something with, 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 within our means. So the good news is that renewable energy is winning, it's taking hold, and the prices are dropping. It's actually less expensive <coughs> to build uh, electric, uh, utility scale solar right now than new natural gas or coal or nuclear energy. It's a unsubsidized, it's actually, it's actually cheaper to put um, wind or solar plants in than it is to put new natural gas. A, a few natural gas can kind of compete, but as time is going on, solar and wind prices are dropping and dropping and dropping. So renewable energy deployment is happening. And um, Xcel Energy, which is one of the biggest utilities in the country, uh, they have said that they would be 100% carbon free by the year 2050. They're doing that because their customers want it, but also because it's cheaper, like I just showed you. It, it just makes sense to do it. Texas right now has 15.7, about 16% of their electricity is generated, uh, was generated in Texas in 2017 by wind. So it's happening. Energy storage is also happening. You see solar and storage or wind and storage projects happening. Tesla, um, there's a Tesla battery that was, that was installed in, in um, Australia. And uh, that happened in record time in 100 days and it saved them money. In XL Energy, which is another, again, the utility, has replaced two Colorado coal plants with renewable plus storage systems. And then uh, in the fall of 2018, California had, um, had the approval, Portland General Electric uh, um, utility in California, to replace three California gas plants with storage. And Tesla is also in other, other storage units are, are involved in microgrids in different islands, like Tesla is in the island of Samoa. Uh, 